Okay. So on to our next speaker, Libby Gill is with us today. So after nearly 20 years in senior leadership roles at media giants, Universal, Sony, and Turner Broadcasting, as well as the PR br branding brain behind the launch of the Dr. Phil Show, Libby is now CEO of the business coaching and brand strategy firm, Libby Gill and Company. A sought after international speaker, Libby is one of a handful of female speakers with C-level experience, top-notch content, and dynamic delivery. Her clients have included Nike, Warner Brothers, Disney, Oracle, PayPal, Kellogg, Avery Dennison, CA Technologies, Microsoft, and many more. A frequent media guest, Libby has shared her success strategies on the Today Show, CNN, NPR, Oprah and Friends, um, MSNBC, CBS Early Show, and in Time Magazine, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Business Week, O Magazine, Good Housekeeping, Self, and numerous media outlets. With a focus on helping individuals and organizations capture the mind share, that is, the hearts and heads of their customers, colleagues, and communities, Libby delivers keynote addresses, custom training programs, and coaching for companies desiring to create a culture of risk-taking, innovation, and bold leadership. Her proven clarify, simplify, and execute process inspires people to maximize their leadership DNA, build high passion, high performing teams, and increase employee engagement through authentic brands. Deciding she would answer the call of entrepreneurship, Libby left the corporate world and founded Libby Gill and Company in November of 2000. As she was reinventing her professional life, Libby's personal life also went, underwent a major transformation. She chronicled her journey of overcoming the self-perceived limitations left behind by a family legacy of alcoholism, divorce, mental illness, and suicide in her best-selling book, Traveling Hopefully, How to Lose Your Family Baggage and Jumpstart Your Life by St. Martin's Press. Libby's bestseller, You Unstuck, Mastering the New Rules of Risk-Taking in Work and Life, was the recipient of an Independent Publishers Award. Business leaders, including Zappos.com CEO Tony Shea and Dr. Ken Blanchard, have endorsed her book. A member of the Authors Guild and Rock School Scholarship Fund Advisory Board, Libby lives in Los Angeles and is the proud mother of two fabulous sons, a college senior and a high school senior. Please join me in welcoming Libby Gill. about me now. I think I can just leave. No. Uh, thank you for having me here today. I'm so delighted. And it's so exciting to be able to talk. I love to talk to rooms full of smart, passionate women, and a handful of you men as well, uh, smart, passionate men. But what's so exciting is that this is really the coming together of leadership and brand. And to me, that's really where it's all about. It's all about the stories we tell our own workforce and the stories that our workforce tells our customers. So when you look at leadership and branding, you see that you bring those powerhouses together and you can really change the dynamic both inside and outside of the company. Plus, I just have to say, that presentation from Andy, are you still here, was so terrific. And ADP, I'm an outsider, I don't claim to be an expert, but your cool factor has just gone up so sky high. It's really, right? Really amazing. Uh, such elegant simplicity. Hard to put those together in one sentence. And I heard you all groan at the word simplicity, so I'll be sure to get back to that. But again, thinking about the stories that we tell, it's such an interesting time in this women's leadership world right now. It's become not just a national, but a, an international conversation. And it's really up to us to make those changes where we are. And you look at some of the stories that we've been exposed to over the last couple of years, and the, and the conversation has become so heated, you, you can't ignore it. A couple of years ago in the Atlantic Monthly, Anne-Marie Slaughter, who was the State Department planning director, told a story, some of you may have seen that, where she said that women can't have it all. And it was a story about how she decided to quit the State Department 
and go home to be with her children. The right move for her, obviously, but a difficult, heartbreaking story to tell. And then, of course, there's Sheryl Sandberg, who's told us all to lean in, which is a great message at the right time. One of my personal favorites is uh, Rosa Parks, who is a, I'm sorry, Rosa Brooks, wrong Rosa. Rosa Brooks, who is a law professor at Georgetown, who said, can't we just recline? Uh, which I thought was kind of brilliant. Yeah, there are times it feels like, please just let me recline. And then in one story that caught my eye just last Friday, this just broke last week, it was a study published by the University of Washington. If any of you saw this, I saw it on the BBC News feed. And it was about the um, CEOs. If you go to Google Images, what do you see when you type in CEO? Well, you see something like this. And not just once, but twice. And then on the third page, you finally see a woman. And who do you suppose that one woman was? Anybody know? Take a guess. I'll repeat it. Don't worry about mics. But Meg Whitman, good guess. Who else? Hillary Clinton, that'd be a good guess. Oprah, Martha Stewart, no. Check this out. CEO Barbie, I kid you not, just put Google CEO Barbie in your search engine, you will see a ton of stories. Not only that, but this wasn't even Mattel. This is from The Onion spoofing CEO Barbie and saying that Mattel is giving girls unrealistic career goals. So that, I mean, what a groaner, right? That's the first woman that we see. Now, I, I, I bet that Google has done some, some quick changes today to mix that up. But that was really, really eye-opening to see what, we're, what people are seeing when they type in CEO. And of course, we know that because we've all sort of lived that story. And before I jump into to some of the ideas I want to share with you. First of all, you all got some great information this morning. So much excitement in this room about what's happening at ADP. I mean, I talked to a number of you, but I had no idea how far down the road you were in terms of women's leadership. What you heard from Kathy and from Debbie and Maria and from Rita, all of the good news about all these things that are happening institutionally. So what I really want to talk about today are some of the things that you can do individually, because it really is that combination of, you know, what, it's like the old Kennedy line, not what you can do for your country or your country can do for you. It's, it's not just what the institution or the company is doing for you, but what are you doing as an individual, because that's really where it starts. But before I jump into that, I want to ask you, when you think about leadership and your role as a leader, no matter where you are, I'm not talking about job title, letter, number, grades, whatever you've got, but just when you think of what makes me a better leader, what drives me, just, and we don't need to do mics yet, I'll just repeat this, just one word like you did with the women here, one word about what moves you to go the distance, to really be the best leader you can be. What is that trait, that sort of secret sauce? Uh, and there's no right or wrong answer, by the way. There's, uh, I don't, don't have any, you know, it's just your opinion. I'm always curious about what makes a great leader. You're sitting right in front, you're in the splash zone, which means you're courageous. Um, what would you say? Lead by example, that you're a great role model. And you've got a lot of them in this organization. Two on the executive committee, but lots more all around you. Lead by example. Who else? Yes. Be resilient. I love that word. Resilient. You've got to bounce back. And you've got to bounce back faster and better. Who else has another one that you think? Yes. Be honest. Be honest. Integrity is sort of baseline. That's foundational. Be honest. And I think that also includes... Show your mistakes once in a while. Be transparent while you're being honest. Yes, is that what you mean? Anybody else? Yes. Decisive. Decisive. Make a decision, even if it's the wrong one, as you will sometimes make. Act. Take action. Yes. Be compassionate. That's really critical. And I think women get that innately. We're the ones looking at those little baby feet usually, right? And yes. 
Confident. Confidence is really important, and we'll talk a little bit about that. There's some, a little bit of a misperception, I think, about confidence in the workplace, and, and I will admit, I was one of those, I've got a blog on my website about being confident and what that means and studies on confidence. I think women, many of us really know our value. What we don't, and we know, even know how to articulate it. Whether we know how it fits into the hiring system and when and where to insert what our value is, is really the trick. How do you gracefully make sure that that message is heard about what you're capable of? And it can be very difficult. We know the deck is stacked against us a little bit. There's a ton of data on that. The good news, as Rita pointed out, there's data now over the past 20 years. I mean, the people couldn't, like Catalyst and other organizations, couldn't really accumulate much data because it wasn't there. Things hadn't changed. That's beginning to change now. So the things that you said, compassion, honesty, being a role model, being an example to others, uh, and being results-oriented, decisive, all of those things, I think, are critical for leadership, and you define your story. Yeah, I heard you, you were all talking earlier about your personal brand. It really is, there's a funny James Bezos quote, uh, Jeff Bezos, sorry, the CEO of Amazon, who said, your brand is what people say about you when you leave the room, which is a pretty good definition of your brand is you all the time, what you do and what you put out there. There's another trait that I think really embodies that great leader, really separates good, strong leaders and managers from people who are truly inspirational. And this is a quality that many people don't associate with the workplace. And to me, it's, it's the most essential quality of leadership and also probably the most overlooked. And that quality is hope. And I'll define for you what I mean by that, because there's actually an emerging body of science called hope research, hope theory, that is growing out of the medical and positive psychology communities. And I'm applying as much of that as I can to the workplace. And hope actually comes from the old English word hopian, which means to leap forward with expectation, which is what I think we need to do when we are leaders. We're always leaping forward and, uh, and bringing other people with us. It's that lift, climb, uh, lift as you climb. It's that idea, leap forward and bring people along. So in this world of hope theory, one of the early hope theorists is a man named Dr. Jerome Groupman. And Dr. Groupman is a Harvard-trained oncologist, AIDS researcher, and he's one of the primary theorists in this whole idea of hope. And Dr. Groupman started his career as a clinician, a cancer doctor, giving people you know, prognoses about their, their illness. And he found that early on in his career, he would, he would say everything. He would give the patients and their family so much information until he discovered he was inhibiting their own ability to participate in the healing process, that they were so shut down that they couldn't help. And this was not just woo-woo, mind over matter. You know, I'm from Los Angeles. Yoga heals all, um, which I happen to believe. But it wasn't that. It was that when you are, when you and anybody who's had an illness or has gone through that with a, with a loved one, it is that, that belief, that ability that allows endorphins and enkephalins, uh, brain chemicals to kick in that suppress pain, that boost immune system. It's a physiological trait. So what Dr. Groupman found was that he found once he, he first gave too much information, people went into overwhelm and shut down from that healing process. Then, as we often do even in the corporate world, the pendulum swung completely in the other direction, and he decided to limit you know, the information he gave. And what he found the effect of that was that people thought, oh, everything's fine. No news is good news. And that wasn't accurate either. That wasn't always the case. So he had to find that mid-ground where people could recognize, yes, there's an issue, there's a problem, or in, in his case, there's an illness in the workplace. There is a real challenge here. There are setbacks and obstacles, but we can still see our way to success, and that's what he called true hope. And how I see that is, uh, is first the key elements of hope. And I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, what does hope have to do with leadership? Or you've heard 
Hope is not a strategy, right? I just spoke to the Department of Defense and they thought this was so funny because they knew their, their leader of their group, who was like an equivalent of a third star general, her line was always hope is not a plan. And she died when I said hope is not a plan and then qualified it for them. But the key components of hope, according to this idea of hope theory, is that first, it's a belief that change is possible. Now, it seems fundamental, right? We all think change is possible, but just think of your world. Think of that one person that you know that doesn't believe in change. He or she can't get a job, can't lose the weight, can't stop smoking, can't do whatever. And uh, of course, there are real challenges in the world, but there are people who could do things that just believe Change is not possible, end of story. It's the people who say things like, it is what it is, you can't fight City Hall, it's all of those things, defenders of the status quo, right? So it's a fundamental belief that change is possible and a secondary belief and expectation that what you do as an individual moves the needle, that you direct the outcome and it's up to you to make a more positive world for yourself and others. In other words, your actions change the future. So while hope and happiness and optimism are, are all sort of emotional cousins, happiness is the general sense of well-being, right? Self-satisfaction, life satisfaction, absence of real negative feelings. Optimism is defined as a generalized feeling of everything's okay. Life is okay, things will turn out okay. Nothing wrong with that, except that the data will prove otherwise, that in fact the pessimists are far more accurate and realistic than the optimists are. So, but the difference with hope is that it is specific and situational and future focused. When you say, I can change this, and here are the actions that I can take to change my world, that is something based on hope. And I believe that's something, just like you're recognizing a, as a brand, it's about the human. We're putting the human into the resources. Data can take a second position. We know it's there, that's not going anywhere. But it is the resources that humans and the richness of the human experience brings that makes you special. That's a conversation starter internally and externally. Um, so, what this boils down to in the workplace is really that belief drives behavior. It's, as Henry Ford said, whether you believe you can or believe you can't, you're right. It is that idea of whatever you decide is true. I mean, you've seen this with data, right? The confirmation bias. Whatever you believe, you can find the information to support it, right? It's always out there. It's uh, both sides of any, of any issue you can find, you can find some supporting data for. Instead of using the data to inform your decision, if we are grounded in that change is not possible, we're gonna find the data to prove why we've dug our heels in and we're not changing. It, it's interesting, Gloria Steinem, who is the, the great feminist and writer, and uh, she has on her website, as she says, she is a, a self-proclaimed hopeaholic, which I think is great. And in one of her great quotes, she said, um, the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. And I think that's true, is we really have to think about what is the truth? And what does that move me to do? Where does that get me angry? Where does that get me sort of riled up? And what action does that make me want to take in the workplace? What am I going to take? Some of you are already thinking, well, how does this go back to my team? What am I going to do? How am I going to make a difference? And um, one thing I want to ask you, if you think about that, the truth, that true hope versus the rose-colored glasses, knowing that change is possible and it's up to you to dictate the future, let me ask you something. And that is simply, what do you feel hopeful about? Framed that way, not a pie in the sky. Hope is not just blanket optimism or happiness, but it's the idea that you can change the future based on your actions. And I wanna ask you to just sort of fill in that blank of today I feel hopeful about, and turn to somebody next to you, and just share that two ways, and then we'll share a little bit for your recording. So just share what you feel hopeful about. And by the way, I've heard everything from ending world hunger to getting a date on Friday night. So 
All is fair. It doesn't matter how big or small, where you want to frame that. It's just something that you can change the outcome of. So go ahead. And for now, I would love for any brave person to share what you're feeling hopeful about. And by the way, I, I, I have a theory. In forums like this, where you're in a safe space, you're surrounded by really good-hearted, like-minded people, this is a good place for the introverts among us. And I'll bet you all said, Debbie, an introvert, right? But yes, you know that you are. Um, I always tell people I'm a situational extrovert. I can pull it out when I need to, but left of my druthers, I'm back by myself in my office. So it's a muscle, obviously, that you can learn to use. So these are forums. It's a long way of saying I invite introverts to raise your hand and stand up and participate. Leadership is about participation. So who is uh, willing? And, and did I mention the, get, the bribes, the, the gifts? I'll, I'll, a book for somebody who's willing to share what they're feeling hopeful about today. There we go. Now let's get a mic over here to you. This is, and just stand up and tell us your name and, and. My name is Jill Vitale, and I feel hopeful about my son going to college and that I've prepared him to be a good person. Yay. And make good decisions on his own. Good for you. Son going to college. You're hopeful he's going to get there because you've laid the groundwork. All right. Thank you very much. Um, OK, let's jump on ahead here. There, so the truth will set you free. And uh, as Rita mentioned, you, you, you got to start from awareness. That's what data is for. Left to my own devices, because I, I sort of a left brain, right brain split, but I veer towards the intuitive and the anecdotal, which means I've got to measure everything. I put data, and in my coaching work, everything's on a 1 to 10 scale, a 1 to 5, a 1 to 100. I put measurements around everything. That informs your starting point, that awareness. So some truths about women in leadership. And anybody that's taking notes, or if you want my slides, I'm happy to provide them. I'll give them to Kathy and the team. And, or you can just email me at Libby at LibbyGill.com. If you're writing your own thoughts, please have at it. Continue that. And also, I've got something on my website for women. And I'll send that to you all uh, about women's leadership, lots of different blogs and pieces that you can refer to. So these are compiled from different sources, but some basic truths in the workplace today. And, and as I mentioned before, I think ADP is doing a great job. And I've got to say, I, I, uh, I was talking to Maria earlier. I've, I've worked with women in leadership across the country, including Genentech and Microsoft and Kellogg's and Intel. And you're way up there in terms of your, rep your representation. I think far beyond technology, right, Rita? Way beyond. I was just in the Silicon Valley where Hillary Clinton did come in keynote. And they were 5,000 women bemoaning where they sit in terms of women at the top. So some truths about women in leadership. We sometimes see that men are hired for potential. It's like he's got it in him. But women are hired for performance. We've got to prove it. We've got to, you're nodding. You know this already. We've got to have the track record. We've got to have the experience. And many of you have heard the data about, oh, when there's a job posting, men will go after it. If there's 60% or 40% qualified, women have to be 85 or 100% qualified. I think that's less about our understanding of our value than it is about our understanding of the hiring practices and systems. You've got to understand. Nobody expects you to be 100% qualified. And if they do, they're, you know, they're, they're smoking something out there. They expect you to have a good background for that position, certainly. But go give it a shot. And I've got a story for you about that I want to tell you in just a minute. Also, that there are fewer female role models. You said that we need those examples. You've got two on your executive committee, which is really good in terms of corporate America. Women are not only excluded from, inform from formal networks, as you know, but also the informal ones. Uh, I don't know how many of you are playing 18 holes of golf on the weekend. And I'm not a, a male basher by any means, but the data will bear this out. There are clear differences in the workplace. But nonetheless, I think the doors are open, and it's really up to us to walk through them. And that requires 
those of you at the institutional level that can make those changes, doing that from within as your will board and your team is doing, and those of us as individuals also taking those risks, taking those chances to form and join those networks. Another thing is the lack of sponsors. We've heard a lot about this, right? Forget the mentor, get a sponsor. And this means creating opportunities, finding opportunities, grabbing that woman and saying, you'd be perfect for this. And I heard you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna out you just a minute, saying that you, you were considering, I hear this all the time, thinking about a job, do I really wanna do it? Is it gonna really impact my work-life balance? We've all said that or heard somebody else say that, but you gotta test it out. You've gotta push back. As you were saying earlier, you ask those questions. What is this going, there's nothing wrong with saying, how will this impact my family? I mean, this is a company, a more human resources company. It is certainly fair to ask that question. And there are times, like Anne Marie Slaughter, left the State Department because she wanted to take care of her kids. Absolutely fair, we gotta make those hard choices. But don't opt out before you test and ask. Uh, the other thing is if you feel like we're not always seeing that sponsorship from the men, because it is human behavior to create a similar world around us, it's got to be up to women to create that sponsorship. You've got to make and create those job opportunities for the women around you. And as you were saying that Cheryl Sandberg said, it's your responsibility because even if you don't want the CEO job and of high performing women, the studies I've seen, about 40% say, yeah, I'd kind of like that C job. And these are already women that are way up the food chain. 40%, it's not 60 or 80, but it's not as many as you would think. So maybe you don't want it, but maybe your daughter does, or your niece, or your sister, or somebody else you know. So by moving up, you are creating opportunities for other people. Uh, if you don't, if we ignore these things, if we ignore these truths that are data-proven truths about women in leadership, what happens? Well, we get that broken pipeline the broken pipeline that Rita was talking about. Now, I've got some data from companies across the board. You were looking at Diversity Inc., I think, which came in at a slightly higher level in terms of companies that are already pretty good with diversity and inclusion. This data looks at the pipeline problem, first of all, among women. New hires, about 53%. So we know there are more women out there. There aren't a lot more women joining the workforce, but we're a little bit ahead in terms of it being, you know, it's not 50-50, we're a little bit ahead. Uh, now you go up to that next level, the manager level, and that's, this is across all different kinds of job titles, but think of it as sort of that first rung of management. It drops off, it's only about 37%. So there's a big gulf there from the, the entry level to that first rung of the management ladder. Then it gets even a little bit more narrow. 26% make that VP or that next senior level, VP or equivalent level. And then it really starts getting slim, right, where Debbie and Kathy are weighing in, the executive committee, 14%, and this is looking at Fortune 500, top 500 companies, 14%, which you also said, and that's about, that's a pretty good average of what you hear. So look at the, the way this just steps up, and then two to 3% of female CEOs in that Fortune 500. And that number hasn't changed much for about, what is it, about 20 years now? It's about the same, and one of the reasons, it's all of these reasons, but another reason is about 62% of women opt for staff or service, and I'm not talking about client service in your world, but service jobs that aren't on a track to the C-suite or the CEO's office where many more men, about 65% of men, opt for jobs that are specifically P&L and um, those line responsibilities that put them on a path for the CEO's office. So not only do we have a lot of these things working against us, we're not lining up in the right spot. Now, this is not to say that you need to do this. You gotta follow your heart. Look, I've always been a creative person. Communication, branding, media, all of that my whole life. Nobody would want me doing anything close to their P&L sheets. I, trust me, I outsource my math to this day. But 
you've still, there are leadership opportunities across the board in lots of different ways, whether it's got a C title or not. And it's really about, as an individual, saying, look, the institution can only do so much for me. I've asked all the tough questions. I've found all the role models. I've built the networks. Now it's up to me to walk through that open door. And I'll give you an example here. Where's Andrea Burrell? Right here. Andrea, now I'm doing just a little research and my due diligence about the company. We were just talking, and Andrea told me a story. I said, can I tell that story? Because Andrea's been with the company 22 years, 22 years, came through an acquisition. So she's been here at ADP for 10 years, 12, 12 years. So she was tapped in client services, tapped to fill in at a higher level than her regular job, and said, yeah, sure, I could do that. Jumped in, no hesitation, or if you had it, you didn't show it, jumped in, didn't have every qualification for that higher level role, but took it anyway, didn't stop her. And then she applied for the job. After she'd done it for six months, had more exposure, more experience, a greater network. One thing that Andrea did that was really smart was said, hey, this is an opportunity to raise my hand and ask for help, which seems obvious, and yet lots of people would say, this is an opportunity to duck my head under the table so no one knows what I don't know. You went the other way and said, hey, I'm new here. I need some help. And I can't tell you how many, how many men I've worked with to um, create vocabularies, ways to say I don't know, without actually saying I don't know. So it's really, I, have a, I need a backflow of information in this area, please. You know, all that kind of stuff. Rather than say, hey, I'm a newbie. Fill me in, would you? And they did. So Andrea applied for the job, didn't get it, didn't kill her, didn't stop her. She kept doing her job, 18 months rolls around, she applies for another job. And she's, again, this one a little beyond your reach, yes, a little higher up, but she's, you know, she's had the exposure. She's had some, so she's tested her wings and found out one thing they don't tell you is that once you get into those higher ranks, not only do you have bigger headaches, but you have bigger freedom and flexibility. No one is going to say, you can't go to your parent conference because guess what? You're glued to your desk. You, get, you have a little more power. So Andrea went after that job, heavy competition, but as she was, people knew she was in the running, they went to her supervisor, or the hiring manager, and said, hey, if you don't hire her, let me know because we will. She had built a network of people, of allies, that knew what she could do, knew her name, knew the potential, and suddenly it was a completely different story, except she got that job and she's a new VP and this is her first time at Will. So congratulations. And that's just one example of somebody saying, you know what, could be over my pay grade, could be outside my comfort, could be greater than the experience or the certifications or the ch whatever, I'm going to go after it anyway. All they can do is say no. And they said no, and you came back for more, which is really what it's all about. So, And I know there are more stories like that in the room. I just wanted to share that one with you. Who else is new to Will this year? Oh, exciting. Really, you're growing. Just I predict next year, bigger room, more people. You're going to bring them all in. Uh, I'll give you a little background into my own career trajectory. This, this was me back in the day. Um, you heard some of my entertainment jobs. I spent 20 years working in the, what is collectively called branding, communications, media, uh, public relations, advertising. But before that, I worked as a waitress for four years, put myself through a state college in, uh, in California, waiting tables on the Queen Mary in Long Beach, California, got a degree in theater, uh, my kids can tell me, not, you know, they now I got nothing on them. They say, yeah, but mom, you're a theater major. <laughs> so they can study pretty much anything they want. And I majored, had a very useful uh, minor in contemporary dance. <laughs> any, um, any a double whammy, right? Liberal arts killer. Uh, but nonetheless, I went on in my career. I was very fortunate to take that and uh, become a talking Christmas tree. That was my first job at local mall every year, beckoning, see I was in sales and branding, even then pulling people into the mall to spend their hard-earned dollars, staying in the Los Cerritos Shopping Center in my neighborhood, 
went on from there. It got so much better. I was actually able to use my dance experience. That was me, the baby bear. I was a tap dancing bear at Knott's Berry Farm. One summer only, it was so hot in that costume, I could not take it. So I lasted a summer, but you know, nonetheless, things continued, I persevered. Uh, not quite like Andrea, but I continued. And I got my first real on-camera job. Yes, it was a menstrual cramps commercial. And I was the bloated one in between the cramped and the fatigued, but I was on my way, I was not giving up, and then finally, after many auditions and workshops and sending out head sheets and meeting with casting directors, all the stuff young performers do, I got my big breakthrough. I did. I became the hand model <laughs> for Fancy Feast Cat Food. I kid you not, you remember the crystal goblet? That's my hand opening the pop top and Fancy Feast. Yeah, I know, really, boy, weren't my parents proud. But. Um, so you do what you need to do to get where you want to go. And, and what I decided at that point, I actually, I realized in those days, I was a member of SAG and AFTER, the Actors Guilds, and I found out that as an AFTER member of the Television Guild, I was in the top five percentile of wage earners in my guild, earning between ten dollars and $12,000 a year. I thought, boy, what does that say about the other 95% of you? And it did not take a math genius to figure out this did not bode well for my future. So I went behind the camera, started working for a company that was then, had been founded by Norman Lear, who, if you know your TV, he goes all the way back to All in the Family and all those great sitcoms of the 70s and the 80s. And I thought, how great to join this midsize, this little company, where I get to put a hand in everything. I'll get to do a little of, you know, all kinds of things and learn everything. And very quickly, that little company was bought by Coca-Cola and then Columbia Pictures and then sold to Sony. So in a span of about five years, we had four major mergers and transitions. And all I knew, it was sort of ignorance is bliss back then for me. I just kept raising my hand and saying, oh yeah, I could do that. And in five years, I went from being an assistant in the PR department to being vice president of publicity, advertising, and promotion for Sony's worldwide television group. And I learned very quickly, especially having people who were, you know how we say, we, oh, we want people smarter and more experienced. Well, I had people who were smarter and more experienced everywhere. And when you all were talking about your first day in the executive committee meeting, my first day, we didn't have an, an ex-con, but we had senior staff. So my first day in senior staff, first, I had a suit that cost more than my car payment. And that was the first time ever, like a real suit. I went into the staff meeting with all the big people. And what they don't tell you is, yes, there was collective wisdom in your ex -con. Those are smart people. But they're not like off the charts Einstein smarter than you are. You can clearly hold your own. So when here I was, a new VP, into the inner sanctum and thought, so the same knuckleheads I work with every day. They're just all gathered in one group. But I went in, I sat down, and this was back in the days of pagers, and I got a page from the chairman of the group. And I thought, what, what do I do? I'm with the whole senior staff, and now the chairman. And I thought, you know, here I am in my first senior management dilemma, and I thought, well, you know what? I'm always on call. I deal with the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Daily Variety every day. They're not gonna know who's calling me. I'm just going to slip out like it's you know something important, and I did. And the chairman of the group was calling me to say, "Hey, I bet you've got your first senior staff meeting today. Congratulations!" So I proudly went back in as if I'd put some serious fire to bed, and and uh, continued on from there. But there's a real power that we get when we're we're invited in and we see hey, I can hold my own, and yes, there's a learning curve, and it could be steep, but I think it was very funny that you were the entertainment, the two of you, and I think it was just a different point of view, a different style than people were used to, and you can use that to your advantage. So what I learned in all of those companies, in 20 years in the corporate world, now 15 years I've had my executive coaching and uh, consulting business, I've gotta say, listening to the energy and everything that's going on today, it's the first time I've thought, in 15 years, hey, maybe it'd be fun to go back into the corporate world. Now, now I, I won't do it, but it sounded really exciting, everything that's happening. But what I learned 
is that there are people, great leaders, who can take the complex because what you do, what everyone does, is inherently complicated. And some people seem hell-bent on making it more complicated. And those are the people that just take the joy and the possibility out of the workplace. Well, there are other people who seem like they can take that complex and distill it so that you can understand it and you can act upon it. And to me, those are the real inspirational leaders. And so when I, I coach across industries, aerospace and media and healthcare, and so I'm always looking for what is that, what applies to everyone? What do we need is a very simple working mantra. And this is mine. First, clarify the vision. And just for the purposes, and we all have vision statements, and they frequently, I forgot what Andy called, oh, tombstone statements. Yes, they line the hallways of the, you know, the, the cafeteria, employee cafeteria. You, you put them on pillows. It's when you really use them that they're relevant. And it sounds like you're one more human, a, a what was it again? More, a, more human resource is absolutely you know, usable. You will use that. It's first to clarify the vision. And so I, what I want to ask you is right now, in this room, if you're back here, and let's assume you'll all be back here with other colleagues next year, what do you need to do? What is that overarching, got to do it, must? And I'm not talking about meetings that you'll attend or phone calls you'll return, because you're doing all of that anyway. But how do you elevate your own career path, your own business? What is that one thing? If I said you can only do one, what would be that one thing you would choose to be able to share next year that you did, above, aside from everything that you're already doing? And this is not to make your life more complicated. This is to say, what's most important? Because the higher up you go as a leader, the more you have to let go of. Now, it's not always your children, especially if they're three years old. You don't want to do that. But there are three years old, yeah, you don't want to do that. But there are other things that we can let go of. And the real leaders are able to release some of that. So clarify that vision, and we'll come back to this. Where do you want to be in a year? Simple, one line, fill in the blank. In one year, this is my vision. Next, simplify the path. Instead of making it more difficult, any of you members of uh, Overthinkers Anonymous, we tend to make everything so complex. Simplify it. How do you boil it down, get the wrong things out of the way, whether those are excuses, bad habits, time wasters, the wrong people? Move those aside. Bring in what's going to help you get the job done. What is going to help you really make a difference, whether it's teams, resources, data, technology, what is going to make you more accountable to that vision? And simplicity is really important. And I heard you all groan. Uh, and I said, I said to you, Gina, what, what, simplicity, not a big word here? No, simplicity is hard. Yes, of course it's hard. There's a great uh, sort of a, a landmark Columbia Business School study. And many of you are numbers crunchers. And I know you're all disciplines, but you'll appreciate this. This study looked, analyzed the data in retirement fund options, looking at 800,000 employees across 647 companies. And the retirement packages offered options from two to 59 different options, depending on the package. They looked at all that data, who was doing what, and found that the more options people had, the fewer participated in their retirement funds, even with matching funds and all that good stuff. Too many options, I don't even want to think about it. And among those who did participate, the more options, the more choices they had, the more risk averse they were with their money. So what does that tell you? We shut down in the face of too much complexity. We need things boiled down for us. We need a little of that, you all call white space. We need a little of that white space so we can be creative and strategic. I just ducked out. I was here all morning, but ducked out for a couple of two quick uh, check-ins with a couple of my coaching senior leaders who, um, you know, and it's, it's so interesting how they'll overload 50 things, you know, all of these different things swirling and forget to say, well, what's the most important thing? What is it you're trying to accomplish? Where do we need to move the needle? Finally, you've got to execute the plan, back to being decisive, being results-oriented. What are you getting done? How do you execute against this vision that we've created? 
And I want to take that a little deeper in terms of how you actually execute and get these things done. And I'll, I'll give you an example from when I was at Universal. I was, I was recruited to head up corporate communications at Universal. And it was one of those nice kind of high class problems when I was offered a job at CBS and at Universal at the same time and decided I would go to Universal because at that point in, in the history of the company, it had it held the record for the most stable management leadership in the history of entertainment. One guy, famous mogul, Lou Wasserman, at the helm of that company for 50 years, and his second in command. So very stable, debt-free, you know, huge, but also, as happens after a long time, they've gotten very stale. So a new owner had come in. Uh, the Bronfman family owned Seagram's Liquor. Made absolutely no sense. Don't ask me to explain it. I was the one who had to explain it to the public. Made no sense to me or anyone else why a spirits company bought a studio, but they did, and it was a disaster. But at that time, every business unit had, had changed in the span of 18 months. So there was a new president. There weren't any president, female presidents, male presidents in motion pictures and music and television and consumer products all across the company, massive change. And when we look at what that does to people and why it makes them so nervous, we just often have this blanket, oh, people hate change. But there are underlying factors. Uh, sometimes people feel disloyal to their former employees if they, if they embrace the new. Sometimes they feel like, I don't, my skills are not up to par. I don't know what these people coming from the outside know that I don't know. There are all sorts of fears and concerns that get triggered. So for me, I thought, well, I'm, communic I'm the head of communications for this group. I'm just going to go out and communicate. I'll do what I do because I really believe we have to create a shared vision here. We have to get on the same page, and that's going to require some time together, some rapport and trust. So I was a, as a department head, one of the perks of the job was my little golf cart. So, you know, Universal Studios, anybody been to Florida or uh, Hollywood? It's big. It was 540 acres, and I set 15-minute appointments basically with anybody that would speak to me. And it wasn't always easy. I thought, well, you know, just meet with me. No, had no interest in the new team coming in. So I was persistent. And for about three months, my calendar just had these chunks of meetings with HR, accounting, the costume people, the producers, the on-air talent. I mean, anybody that was willing to sit down for a face-to-face. -face. And I got my little golf cart, and I drove past the New York town and past the Cowboy Village and the parting of the Red Sea. And I went out to all these places and sat down with people and basically just said, tell me about your job. What can I do for you? How can we work together? What, in all the basics, it did not take a rocket scientist by any means to figure this out. But I kept hearing, huh, no one from corporate has ever been over here before. And it was just that, let's break down the silos. Let's break down the walls and talk to each other, and then continue to build on that. And pretty soon, people started to see, you know, we were not the evil empire. We were not out to get them. And I would invite them in to weigh in on certain things. Sometimes it made perfect sense. Other times it was a bit of a stretch. But my team, who was charged with promoting the new shows every year, it was a lot easier for a new show than it is you know, year 18 of an old show. But we were always thinking of crazy ideas and things like, well, hey, you know, it's, we're on this studio lot with those giant sound stages like you see at the beginning of a movie. My team said, hey, why don't we paint a big logo? We're right at the intersection of all the traffic choppers. All the radio shows fly right overhead. Let's paint a 30-foot logo on the roof and let the DJs talk about us. So I went to the building facilities guys, and nobody meets with the building facilities guys, I got to say, at a studio lot. And they thought, this is the coolest thing I've ever heard. We get to be part of a media event. And pretty soon, and the tour guides, you know, there were 14 million people marching through that, those, uh, the theme parks uh, all summer long. And as a marketer brander, I, I, to me, it was criminal that they had no signage, no representation of our own shows that we produce. No, so pretty soon, it just took a little wooing. We had trailers in the queue lines. We had strolling characters based on our shows. We had, I owned six billboards on the entrance to the theme parks after that. But it was that idea of, 
let's build some possibilities. Let's talk about what we might do together. Let's make this exciting and fun and have a shared vision. And sometimes when you think, why is that person ever get, what, is, what do I have to do with that person or they with me? You don't know until you have that one 15 minute conversation. So what can stop you? I mean, we know these things. Most of us know all the things we need to do to get out of our comfort zone. I'd uh, love to come up with another phrase for that. But that idea of how do I elevate my game? How do I do more than I've done in the past? But we are, you know, we are hardwired. We are biologically hardwired to protect ourselves. We've got our early warning system, which is our fight or flight, you know, when you get all those senses going. And we're, we're wired to, to take off in the face of danger, predator danger. Now, it's the same our, our uh, amygdala, our primitive brain, perceives danger. It's, it doesn't have to be physical danger, but we see it in pretty much the same way. Ooh, I got to speak up at this staff meeting? Yuck, that my adrenaline is flowing, uh, cortisol is starting, your palms are sweating in order to cool down your extremities. All of those things are happening because your primitive brain has set them off just in order to keep you alive. That's a good thing. But we sometimes let that fear take over. And sometimes just our own biases, our own, where's Donna? You were talking about our history our history, uh, how that impacts our, our, oh, there you are, thank you. Yes, I love that. I didn't have those parents that you mentioned, by the way, but um, some people do, that our, our history can define or at least uh, it sets in motion our present and our future. And sometimes we hold tight to those, that baggage and those biases, and we gotta start moving those. If we're gonna change the workplace for women, and I, I, and I mean that literally. If we in this room are going to change the future of women at ADP and maybe beyond ADP, we got to start letting go of some of that stuff. So I want to just look at your own preferences now. And I'll just uh, I'll test this on you, a little experiment. Just You may have seen this before, but just clasp your hands, just like you normally would. Just clasp your hands. And just look at which hand is on top, your left, uh, your thumb. Your left or your right, and, and raise your hand if you're left thumb on top, like I am, left thumb, okay. Those of you, right thumb on top, and look around there, oh, a little bit, about 60-40. This generally splits 60-40, um, 50-50, doesn't matter how many people. Has nothing to do with hand dominance, or we'd be about 90-10. And now just switch it the other way, and you may have tried that. It's like, ooh, ah, that doesn't fit. That's not quite right. I don't like that, right? Weird. Now, but we're, that's easy. We're going to up the ante now, though. So cross your arms. Cross your arms. And now let's see which arm you have on top. I've got my right arm, but I had my left thumb, so there's really no correlation between those two. So if you have your right arm on top, raise your hand. Let's take a look around. OK, right arm. Now, those of you with the left arm on top, and that splits closer to 50-50. OK, so cross it back like you had it comfortably. And now just look over at your neighbor. See if they're doing it right. Oh, I mean, just see what, see what they're, okay. Now, you know what's coming, right? Let go, cross it the other way, and it just, oh, it just doesn't want to go there, does it? Yeah, okay, I know, you want to do like all kinds of things. All right, so here's what this means. Those of you who had your right arm on top like I did, congratulations. You have a natural predisposition for leadership. No. <laughs> I had some of you, didn't I? Yeah. No, no, it, it really doesn't mean anything, except that this is a preference that you chose when you were about three, and you've always done it that way, and you're always going to do it that way, but the interesting thing is the other half of the world does it exactly the other way and feels just as strongly as you do. My point being, of course, that we've got to let go of some of that. We've got to see it from the other person's perspective. We've got to let that filter, we've got to let that in and try it on. And that's the way we're going to change those. Institutionally, it takes a lot of work and a lot of heavy lifting, and that's happening. But individually, we can start to challenge those assumptions. We can start to make new decisions and have different conversations. Now, as you uh, heard in, in my bio that Kathy read, I, I am a little bit too familiar with family baggage. This is my family, my parents up there. This is, I was one of six kids. I'm the, 
I'm the cute one over there on the far, um, no, I'm not on the bottom row there. And I grew up in the South, in, uh, in Florida, which if any of you know Florida, Northern Florida is the deep South. The rest of it is just tourists and people from out of state. So I grew up in sort of the deep South. My dad was a very prominent doctor. We were, we were privileged kids. I, you know, we had the, the big riverfront estate and the tennis court and the swimming pool and the private prep schools, the whole works, until I was 10. On Christmas Day, it all came to a stop. And on that day, I went into the kitchen, and all the kids come rushing in you know, to rip open the presents. And there is a neighbor sitting there at our kitchen table. And even at age 10, you know something's up if that's happening. And our neighbor told us that my oldest brother, David, who was a freshman at Princeton home on his first Christmas break, had been gone to a party the night before and was in a, an accident, and he was at the hospital, and my parents were with him. Now, what I didn't know until I fact-checked my book, Traveling Hopefully, with my mom, which is really a trip when you've avoided discussing family issues for 40 years, and then you write a book about it, um, she told me that my father had taken my brother out to lunch on Christmas Eve day and told him he was about to divorce my mom and marry a patient. Now, my dad was a psychiatrist in a small southern town, leaving his wife and six children for his own psychiatric patient. As you can imagine, this did not go over very well. Um, so my brother actually did die that day. And my dad went ahead and left my mom and decided he would go forward and marry this patient. It was a two-year battle in the interim for really everything that wasn't nailed down, and, and even the house, which was nailed down. So we were in and out of courtrooms until my dad finally decided, I'll just, uh, I'll just leave. And he sold his medical practice and commissioned in the military. He'd been a young officer through med school and moved to Japan. So instead of doing the kind of the every other weekend divorce dad thing as kids, it was every summer going from Jacksonville, Florida to Japan to visit my dad. And then ultimately, I ended up living there. And then one day, we moved back here. That's when I had gone to six different high schools in six years, completely rootless. My parents decided right when I graduated from high school, my dad and stepmom, that they would go back to Florida. And I was 18, graduated from high school, and said, I think I've had enough. Whatever that college is over there, I'll just go there. And I got a job and got an apartment and started waiting tables and put myself through college. I was an adult by then. And then one day when I got that first real job working for Norman Lear's company, I got a call from my dad. And my stepmother, they, he'd had a fight with my stepmom. She had gone into the guest room, taken an overdose of sleeping pills and scotch, and committed suicide. And by then, my father had disowned all the other siblings. And you can see why there was a book in this, in my family. So I went home and took care of everything and ended up the one thing, after giving away her clothes to Goodwill and the housekeeper that my father could not part with, was her full-length mink coat, my stepmother Fran's mink coat with her matching mink hood. So there I am in my 20s, living in this little hovel of an apartment in Hollywood, trying to make it in show business going home with my stepmother's mink coat, which I needed like a hole in the head. And I hung it in the closet and forgot about it, went back to work. And I worked and worked and worked. And estranged from the family, I just kept working. I, you know, Fear and loneliness will make you a very good employee, but it's not necessarily the way to live. And then one day realized I could do better than that. So I, um, I thought about it. And I, you know, I was kind of stymied on how to do that. And like, you know, like a young kid at that sort of crossroads in life, I thought, I'll just go in the kitchen, see if there's any booze. Now, I wasn't much of a drinker back, back then anyway. Um, so I, um, there was, I found a big bottle of brandy one of my roommates had left behind. I took a big slug of that and then another. And then I thought, hey, I've never tried on that mink coat. So I went into the bedroom, my bottle of brandy, tried on that mink coat. And the first thing I could think was, boy, this feels so luxurious and so decadent. I wonder how many dead animals it took to make this one mink coat. And I just lost it. I fell on the floor, crawled into the hallway, and stayed there in my mink coat with my bottle of brandy, crying my eyes out for an entire weekend. And finally, at one point, I thought, gee, I've got so many bad role models sort of swirling around. I could be one of them. 
or I could just get my ass up off this floor and do something with my life. And I tell you, it was like whatever you believe in terms of you know, the universe or spirit, it was like arms coming through those sleeves, because I still had on the coat, lifting me up. And I got up and thought, OK, I'm going to change my life. And if I can change a couple of others along the way, so I'll be the, the happiest person on the planet. And I know we've all got those stories. Everybody has their own version of the mink coat story, either at work, at home, in your early life, because people now come up and tell me their stories. But it's that choice in those difficult moments in relationships, in work, in illness, in happiness. It's all of those things. What do we do now? And what do we do now? And that's what drives us. And uh, this is a picture. I, I, I took this. My son had a, a really difficult illness. And I, when he got well, he, when he graduated from high school, he was finally well. And he said, hey, Mom, I heard Bhutan is this really cool place to go. And I said, huh, where's Bhutan? And he said, oh, well, it's near China and India. So we went on this trip and climbed this mountain in the Himalayas and took this picture up at the top of this most unlikely place for a monastery to be built. So I love this quote by Sir Edmund Hillary, who said, it's not the mountain that we conquer, but ourselves. And I really think that's what women's leadership is about. It is the fact that you are forever looking deeper and saying, what's that vision? What am I going to do differently, better, bigger, bolder? And then taking that idea and saying, what step can I make? So my challenge for you is, what step can you take? What bold move, bold for you, by the end of this conference? What can you do that's going to really make a change, a difference in your own life? And if you're fortunate, in somebody else's lives. And, and I want to help you with this process. I have on the table, and we're going to collect these, a little card that you are more than welcome to fill out for me. And it's just a favor to me if you want to give me feedback. You don't have to. Um, what I'll, you can also just give me a business card if you'd rather do that. And we're going to collect them in a minute. So if you'll fill that out. This is my, I love, Debbie, that your title is uh, Client Experience and Continuous Improvement. You're like the queen of Kaizen. Continuous Improvement. This is my method of continuous improvement. So if you want to share, you are invited to. Um, but I will put you on my newsletter. I only do it once a month, um, so I won't inundate you with anything. I'll try to make it very meaningful. But we're going to pick one out of the hat or fishbowl or whatever we've got after you're ready, as soon as you're ready, and collect those and um, give somebody in this room a coaching session that you are welcome to use for yourself or to bring your whole team on the phone, to gift or Skype, conference call, whatever you want to do, gift it to somebody that you feel could really use that boost or some clarity in their lives. And we'll, um, while you're filling those out, and if somebody at the table would be the collector, then we'll know to come around and just collect when you're finished. And in the meantime, if I can answer any questions for you, I'd be happy to talk about your brand, your career development, your path, the risks that you're contemplating, where you want to go in your own career. Anybody? Um, or you can just fill those out, and I'll uh, give you a minute here. That's fine, too. I put up a page on my website, and, and I'll send this to you all in an email. It's libbygill.com women's events. And I've got some blogs and some resources and some things. I'm always sending articles and you know, sharing good things about, ooh, this is interesting. So um, just raise your hand at your table if you're finished, business cards or my little comment card. And when you're finished with that, uh, we'll come around and collect them. And, uh, and this is where you can find me. I really do welcome phone calls, emails, questions. And people will take me up on this. And uh, you know, six months later, somebody will say, hey, I saw you at ADP, and you said I could call. I'm at a crossroads. And um, I appreciate that. Only the bold and the brave will do that. So I know it's not like 200 people will call me the next day. But I truly do welcome that and encourage that. And as we're collecting those, I want to just wrap up with one little quick story. This is called a, uh, a Daruma, this little guy here, also known as a Goal doll, G-O-A-L. And Daruma is the symbol in Japan. He's the, the god of perseverance. And you, get, you buy this little guy at a shrine or a temple. And 
When, and you, when you get it, those big eyes are blank. And you, you set an intention or a goal, and you color one in. And then when it comes to fruition, you color in the other one. And because this is the, the god of perseverance, you can't knock him over. He's weighted like, like a little weeble. You knock him over, he bounces right back up. You knock him over, he bounces. Like you, Andrea. You have your own uh, quality of being a, a daruma. And uh, you, I mentioned how many times I had moved as a kid. This is, this is my one childhood thing I own. I mean, my first baby picture is at age six. So this is uh, my one childhood um, toy or possession. And I colored in the, other eye, in the first eye when I was 15, and I wished for a happy family, a pretty home, and a great job. That's what I wanted. Still holds up pretty well today. And when I was about 40, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm kind of there. I'm going to fill in the other eye. And I started to fill that in, as you can see. And then I thought, wait a minute, not so fast. I'm not sure I'm there there. I think I might still be a work in progress. So I stopped. And this guy just sort of sits on my desk and reminds me that there's always somewhere else to go, somewhere new to try, some way to elevate my game. And so what I want to ask you now is if you are willing to do something to take these lessons, anything you've learned from me or the other people home with you, and turn into action, if you would simply raise your hand, let me know you're on board. Really easy assignment. It will take you, I know I haven't told you yet, you're still suspicious. It'll take you less than an hour in the course of a month. And you'll be, it, it's what I did when I started my business. I, I left the corporate world, started my first business, got divorced, my dad passed away, and I lost 30 pounds and bought a house all in the same year. I don't recommend that in my late 40s, the first time ever. And this is what got me through the day. So raise your hand if you're willing to try this one simple, and I see now I got you, right? All right, so, and if you don't have a medical excuse, I expect the, yeah, I expect your hand in the air. All right, so here's what you have been voluntold, what you have volunteered to do. That person that you spoke to there, that you had a, a moment with, that's now, that person was chosen by the universe just for you. That person is now your accountability buddy. So when you leave here, what you will be doing I don't know if it's your best friend or your boss, but you're going to have four phone conversations, not face-to-face, -face, not text. Nice, neat phone conversation, 10 minutes, once a week, four weeks, two questions, five minutes each way. What was your big vision for the year? What action did you take towards it this week? Your job on the other side is to applaud, kick them in the rear end, a little of both support. And the idea is that there's always someone out there to help you. And right now, I want to help somebody with a coaching session. So remember when I mentioned introverts? The world not quite being set up for introverts. I would love any kind of self-defined introvert, or just your moment in the sun, come up and tell us your name. I have a book for you as well. And I want you to pull a coaching session out of here, somebody who has, feels like you haven't spoken much today. Who would that be? All right, I'll tell you what. I'll give you a coaching session as well. So what? Oh, come on up. All right, so you have just, you have just gotten your own coaching session. So, and you are? I'm Adrian. Adrian Dalton. Like in the movie Rocky. So it's Adrian. That Adrian. OK, yeah, not, not like quite. That. OK, not like that. Sorry. Yeah. All right, pull out a card and read it for us. And this is the other coaching session. Am I just supposed to read her name? Yeah. Peggy Jude. Peggy Jude. Yay, Peggy. OK, I want, and I want you to come back. I'm going to I want get your card because you've got your own coaching session as well. Just for being brave enough to come up here. I appreciate that. And I will just close with this one quote. And I really think this really speaks to this group. I hoped it would. And I think that it does. And it's from Helen Keller, who's really one of my idols. Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. So here's to you, women of ADP. Thank you.